ask you this morning to turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 in your copy of God's Word. This summer we're exploring encounters, individual encounters Jesus had with people and how those encounters challenged or changed them. For certain, Jesus encountered some interesting characters, but the one today we're going to look at is probably the most incredibly strange and fascinating of all. It's just bizarre. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. This is a story of true freedom. Mark 5, read along with me. They came to the other side of the sea, that's Jesus and the disciples, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I assure you by God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed, in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so he went away. And began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. This is the clearest uh, display in Scripture of the power of God over demons that is recorded in Scripture. Now, we know um, that God, through Satan and all the evil, rebellious angels out of heaven. Uh, We know that there were thousands upon thousands of angels cast out of heaven at the very instant at a very instant by the power of God. But what we have here is not just a mention of his power, but a detailed picture and a demonstration of his power over the devil and his minions. Now, there will be another display like this at the end of the tribulation when Christ comes as Lord and sets up his millennial kingdom. You remember we studied in, uh, in Revelation just a few weeks ago that he would bind Satan and his demons for a thousand years before, at the end of the thousand years, when he would throw them in the lake of fire for all of eternity. Well, let's start at the very beginning. It says in verse 1, they came to the country of the Gerasenes. That's on the east side of, the, of Galilee, of the Sea of Galilee, across from Capernaum. And it's also, um, the same account is recorded in Matthew 8 and also in Luke 8. Matthew says they came to the Gadarenes. It's the same place. They're in the in the region of Gersa, and the the region of Gersa was under the control of the city of Gadara. So this region where they were um, was primarily a Gentile area across the Sea of Galilee from where Jesus normally was ministering. Now, here's the point. They were a very uh, long way from, from home, from where ministry most often occurred. As far as we know, this is the only time that Jesus came to this area, and we're going to see in a few minutes, he wasn't here for very long. And and so why would he travel so far out of his way? Were were Jesus and the disciples, were they just getting away for a little R&R? Was there going to be some additional teaching going on? Why did they make this journey uh, this far away? Verse 2 tells us as soon as they landed, as soon as Jesus stepped out of the boat, he was met by a man with an unclean spirit. And just to, to be clear, an unclean spirit very simply is a demon. 
We know that demons are fallen angels, that they are uh, spirit beings. Uh, We know from what Scripture tells us and from what some have experienced, even in our time, that demons can occupy a a human body. Some of you moms think that happens in your home all the time. They can occupy a human body, uh, only a human body of one who doesn't belong to Christ. If you look down at verse 15, it specifically mentions this man that Jesus said had an unclean spirit. It specifically mentions he was demon-possessed. Well, demon spirits are morally filthy. That's why Jesus said an unclean spirit. Look at verses 3 through 5. It describes the torment that these demons are inflicting on this man. He lived among the tombs. He lived in the cemetery in the place of the dead. Demented people uh, typically were not... Uh, especially at this state, this man was, were not wanted in their village. But it wasn't just the people of the village that drove this man to live in the tombs. It was the demons that possessed him. He lived among the tombs. And that day, the tombs were just uh, rocky caves that were carved out of the hillside where people buried their dead. It says he was possessed by an evil spirit, and that spirit was so ferocious it made him supernaturally strong. They couldn't They couldn't bind him even with chains and shackles. You see the phrase, no one had the strength to subdue him. The word subdue in the Greek refers to the ability to tame a wild animal. This was a wild animal. This this man was not even human. We see that he was driven to destruction. He was driven to violence and to to self-harm by these spirits. Now, where you see that he cried out, um, that wasn't just a crying out like a yelling. It was a horrible Uh, I couldn't even describe to you a horrible demonic shriek that this man would make. They could hear him from far, far off. And then he was cutting himself with stones. Remember that Jesus said in John 10.10, when he said that he came to give life and give life abundant, he said the thief comes to do what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So clearly the thief was at work in this man's life. His behavior is uncontrollable. In Luke's account, he says that the man wouldn't even wear clothes, and and when he wasn't living among the tombs, the spirit would drive him out of there and into the wilderness. So he's a madman. He's a maniac. He's deranged and irrational, subhuman, antisocial. He's a sociopath. He's intensely evil, and he's harmful not only to himself, but also to other people. It's a pretty terrible picture, isn't it? We can't even comprehend. I mean, I've seen people that I would describe as crazy, but not to this degree. Well, in verse 1, we ask the question, why would Jesus travel so far out of his way? It's just one reason for this man. Jesus went out of his way to this place, was there only for moments for this man. You remember in, in Luke 15, Jesus told the parable of the shepherd who would leave the 99 sheep that were secured in his care. He would leave the 99 sheep to do what? To go after the one. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, is going out of his way to find and restore one who was lost, one who was tormented. Jesus, because he is filled with love and compassion, is going to journey this far to go after one who is lost. And can you thank God that he did that for you and for me? There's really no hope for this man apart from Jesus. He's totally out of control uh, to the point that it's frightening to all those who live around him. He's aggressive. He's sleepless. He's, he's restless. He's wandering in and out of tombs, driven into the wilderness. And to relieve himself from his torment, he cuts himself with stones. Verse 6 says, he saw Jesus coming across the sea. He sees him from afar. Now, remember, he's up on this hillside, and Jesus is coming across the Sea of Galilee. He sees him from afar, and the moment Jesus reaches land and steps out of the boat, he runs and falls down before him. Now, how in the world did he recognize Jesus from afar? Jesus had never been to this region before, and even if he had, can you imagine trying to recognize someone from that far off? How was he able to recognize Jesus, and and why did he come in his recognition and fall down before him? Because the demons know who Jesus is. They recognize him spiritually and they recognized him uh, physically. Now, he falls down before Jesus. That, that certainly, um, we would think, would describe an act of worship. But that's not the case here. And this is something really important to remember when, when we come for worship. Worship is a matter of the heart. Worship comes from one who, who recognizes the supreme reverence or respect that they have for the Lord. It comes from the heart. This man, this demon, is not worshiping. This is an act, not of worship, but an act of homage. That's an external action. 
And all the act of homage does is recognize superiority. When a, when a conquering king would take over land and force its citizens to bow before him, that doesn't mean that they loved or even cared for him. They just had to recognize his superiority. So all this demon is doing is recognizing the superiority of Jesus. And we need to be careful when we come for worship that we are actually worshiping not just paying an act of homage. The demons know Jesus is superior. They know he has power over them, but they're not going to willingly surrender in worship. He drops to his knees before Jesus because he knows, the demon knows that Jesus is sovereign and has authority over him. I've mentioned many times Paul's word in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, that Jesus, God gave Jesus a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those who are in heaven, those who are on earth, those who are under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And indeed, everyone who's ever lived and ever will live is going to do that. Those who know him will make that confession as an act of worship. Those who've rejected him will make that confession simply as an act of homage. Verse 7, the demon cries out. Again, it's a shriek and a loud voice. By the way, let me, let me pause here and explain. In verses 7 through 10, you see he or you see they or you see them. This man, as we've already read in the story, is possessed by many demons, but evidently there is one demon who's in charge or he's the spokesman. And so he, the spokesman for these demons, calls Jesus. He cries out in a loud voice. Notice he calls Jesus son of the most high God. They know that Jesus is deity. They know that he's the God man. And that phrase, most high God, was a title that was used by both Jews and Gentiles to declare that the one true living God of Israel was superior from all the faults and man-made gods. So he calls out, Son of the Most High God, what have you to do with me? Or in other words, what business do we have? If you look in Matthew 8 at the same account, the demon says, have you come to torment us before the time? You see, demons know that Jesus has the authority to sentence them. Jesus has the authority to execute them. Jesus has the authority to cast them into that abyss or pit that we studied in Revelation. Jesus will have the authority, already has the authority, and he will throw them into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now, they don't know when that's going to happen. They do know it's not time yet because that will happen at Jesus' second coming. What we're reading, reading here is his first coming where he's the sacrificial lamb. At his second coming, he comes as a conqueror and a judge. They know what is coming, but they don't know the timing. So he says, Jesus, why are you here? What, what business do we have? Jesus responds in verse 9, what is your name? Now, Jesus doesn't need to know the name of this demon to be able to cast the demon out. In fact, he has already, in verse 7, commanded the unclean spirit to come out. And, and the demon interrupts him, and they have this dialogue. He doesn't need to know the name of the demon. He asks the name of the demon for the disciples, for the herdsmen who are gathered there, for me and for you. He asks the name of the demon to show the complexity and enormity of the demonic activity in this man. And he demands the name because he wants us to see the extensive power he has over demons. And what is the name? The name is legion. Legion means a vast number in the, in the Roman army. A legion, a unit called a legion, was 6,000 soldiers. The man was controlled by an extremely large number of demons, of demonic spirits. In fact, you see the demon goes on to say, we are many. And in verse 10, the demons begin to appeal to Jesus. They don't want to be thrown into the abyss. It's not time for that yet, but um, they don't even want to leave the country. Notice the demon says, don't, don't put us out of the country. Why? Because it's Gentile country. And in Gentile country, at this point, there is a lot of false religion and a lot of idolatry. That's how these demons got control of people. And let me pause here and say this to us today. Any religion not built on truth, any religion that doesn't declare that Jesus is Lord is demonic. Do you hear me? Any religion that does not declare the lordship of Christ is demonic, and people who dabble in or, or study or explore other religions are spiritually foolish. And that's the nicest thing I could say. 11 through 13, there's a herd of pigs there. Why? Because it's Gentile country. 
You, you wouldn't find pigs in Jewish country. Large herd, 2,000. And the demons ask to be sent into the herd. And what do the demons do? They do what they do best. They create chaos and destruction. The demons enter the pigs, and the result is violent and deadly. The pigs commit suicide. They take a swine dive. It's waking you up. David Jones, you awake back there? Just checking. All right, here's a couple of things to remember from these verses. First and foremost, Jesus has full authority over the demonic world. He could have sent them anywhere he wanted. And then secondly, although there were many, we know there were at least 2,000 demons because there were 2,000 pigs. There had to be at least one demon per pig. There could have been three demons per pig. Legion could have literally meant 6,000 demons. But this man, all these demons, as many as there were, were no match for Jesus. They had to ask his permission to enter the swine. So he's in complete control. And this is an incredible picture for this man and and the disciples and the others gathered there of the immensity of the evil from which Jesus rescued this man. Verses 14 through 17 describe when the herdsmen run off into town and tell what happened, all the people come out. It describes the odd reaction of the townspeople. Now, I would have expected that they were upset over such a huge loss to their livelihood. I I don't know what was invested in these 2,000 pigs. I don't know what they expected to make out of that, but that's huge. But it doesn't say that they were upset. It doesn't say that they were angry. Look at it. They see Legion dressed and in his right mind. Are, Are they happy? No. Are they amazed? No. Are they surprised? No. What's their response? They're afraid. Now, what are they afraid of? This crazy man that they've been afraid of has been subdued. They're afraid of Jesus. If you've got your Bible open to to Mark chapter 5, back up just a few verses into Mark 4, and you see that just prior to this encounter, on the way to the Gerasenes, to that region, the boat that Jesus and the disciples were in encountered a terrific storm, and you see that Jesus demonstrates his power over the natural world, his power to calm the storm, and Mark 4.41 tells us the disciples were terrified not of the storm. They were terrified after the storm. What? Jesus. It's a fearful thing for sinful man to be in the presence of a holy, almighty God and to see his power and to recognize his sovereignty over everything, not only the natural world in in Mark 4, but the spiritual world in Mark 5. These people, like many people today, were more comfortable with sin and Satan than they were in the presence of God and his holiness. They actually began to plead with Jesus that he would leave them. Listen, if Jesus is wanted, he'll come and dwell. If he isn't wanted, he will leave. They drove him away. You know, honestly, as you think about them being afraid and asking him to leave, even for those of us who've experienced the grace and the mercy of of Jesus and, and therefore have no reason to fear, sometimes we are afraid. We're afraid of allowing the Lord Jesus to have full control of a situation. We're afraid of, of uh, letting him have full control of us because we don't know what might happen. When he's in control, things are going to change, and and we don't always like that. Verses 18 through 20, the the rest of the story. The man at the start was in torment. He was in darkness. He was dwelling in a place of death. By the end, you see he's reunited with society, I assume, with his family. He has a new hope, a new purpose. Beginning of the story, he could break physical chains, but he was bound by spiritual chains. At the end of the story, all the chains have been broken by the power of Jesus. Start of the story, Luke 8 tells us that he was naked, he was wretched. By the end of the story, he's clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And thankfully, normal clothes as well. It's an incredible testimony. In a way, it's the story of us all. We've all been in bondage, spiritually speaking. We've all been existing in a position of death, but we found in Christ 
righteousness, hope, forgiveness, and new life because of an encounter with Jesus. Verse 19, what did Jesus ask in return of this man after finding salvation? Something very simple and very natural. Go home to your family. Remember, the man wanted to be with him. That, that's a great response. It's a very natural response. We should want to be with Jesus for all he's done for us. But Jesus says, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And verse 20, what does it say? He did. Throughout all the Decapolis, that was the ten cities in that region, the man did exactly what Jesus asked him to do. And, and I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been present at this scene. It had to be absolutely terrifying to see a man in this condition, completely under the control of 2,000 demons, and then to see the power of God at work in, in setting him free to be restored to life. The story, I mean, we, we read it. But really, it's, it's beyond our comprehension, and yet it's the story of every one of us. Every one of us in this room who have called on Jesus to set us free from the shackles of sin had the same story. No, we may not have been possessed by 2,000 demons, but we were certainly slaves in the kingdom of Satan. We weren't restrained by physical chains, but we were certainly bound spiritually. Our behavior was ungodly, just like this man, and we were headed for destruction, and then... Jesus came and set us free, and we forget it. We get on down the road after that moment of salvation, and we forget how desolate and desperate our lives were. We forget that had Jesus not come to set us free, we'd have been on the same path of self-destruction. And when Jesus came to set us free, he asked us the same thing. He asked of this man who experienced God's grace and mercy, go and tell what the Lord has done for you and the mercy he has had on you. Listen, if we have found hope and forgiveness, then shouldn't we want others to know where they can find it as well? The applications to this passage for us are very simple. It's two words. It's remember and respond. We need to remember that we were hopeless, that we were out of control, that we were headed on a path of destruction just like this man. And for some of us, we may have to think back a lot of years, but we need to pull that back up and we need to be reminded, we need to remember, and we need to be grateful to God and we need to be gracious to those who are still in that place. These townspeople didn't want to be around this man. And sometimes we have that same tendency. We, we, no, no one in this room, I don't think, knows anyone possessed by 2,000 demons, but we know people who are in the kingdom of darkness, and, and we're kind of like the townspeople. It's kind of messy and ugly and all that, and, and we don't want to be around them. No, we need to remember what God has done for us. We need to be gracious toward those still in the condition. But it's not only remember, <clears throat> we need to respond. And what's our response? Exactly what this man's response was. Jesus says, go and tell others what the Lord has done for you and the great mercy, the favor he has shown you. That's our appropriate response to what he's done for us. It's a pretty simple application. Well, I'm going to go into a five-minute overtime here. I'm done, but I want to say a few other things. We don't have Sunday school following this. I'm early. It's just 10:16. if you're checking your watch. <laughs> I really feel like I need to say a word <clears throat> about demonic possession, just to be sure we're all clear. A thorough study of Scripture would provide strong biblical evidence that for the Christian, and by Christian I mean the one who has surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. For the one who surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, you don't see in Scripture that there's a possibility of being demon-possessed. But before you dismiss this story and say that doesn't have anything to do with me, let me tell you it seems pretty clear from Scripture that a demon can have influence over a believer. Typically, we call that demonic oppression to make clear it's different from demonic possession. If you're a believer, a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've surrendered your life to him, and you've made him Lord of life, you cannot be possessed by a demon, but you certainly, even as a Christian, can be oppressed or influenced. 
In 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter is writing to the church. He's writing to believers when he says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to believers. He's writing to the church. You better be alert. Satan's prowling around. Paul warns us as believers in Ephesians 6.11, we need to be ready to stand against the devil's schemes. So what am I saying to you? As believers, we need to be very careful that we don't open ourselves up or put ourselves in a position where we can be influenced by Satan and his minions, the demons. As believers, we have to be careful what we open our heart and our mind and our spirit to, what we allow access When I was in uh, high school, there were kids, uh, some in my church, even in my youth group, that would play around with Ouija boards, seances, study astrology. And there are all kinds of things like that today. And let me refer back to what I said a few moments ago, the study of false religions, other occultic practices, all these things can open us, open us up to demonic influence. And you may have hear, heard the things I just listed. Well, I don't do any of those things. Well, here's the most common thing for believers that opens us up to demonic influence. Sin. Disobedience to God. I'm not sure we take seriously enough the influence that sin can have in our lives. You know, when you sin as a believer, the Holy Spirit who indwells you immediately calls you to confession and repentance. You you might call it a guilty conscience, whatever you want to call it. If you're a believer, the minute you sin, you know you've sinned. Now, you may have said no to the Spirit long enough that you're not hearing real, real well, but the minute you sin, he calls you to confession and to repentance. But here's the thing, if you don't deal with the sin in that moment, you give Satan a temporary victory and you open yourselves up to demonic influence or demonic oppression. And if you say no to the Spirit in those moments, you continue to allow that influence in your life because you're not confessing and repenting. You continue to allow that, and that influence, that oppression can come to the point where that demon has a very strong influence influence over you. Doesn't possess you, but it has a strong influence over your thoughts and over your behavior. And it's a horrible downward spiral. And the farther you go, the harder it is to make an exit. More sin leads to greater oppression. See, here's the thing. The power for freedom over oppression and victory over sin is always available to you as a believer. The the power of the Spirit is always available, but you have to make the choice to exercise it. You have to avail yourselves of that power by repenting of your sin. Peter in 1 Peter 5, 9, after saying you need to be careful, the devil's prowling around looking for believers, he tells us we have to stand firm and to be steadfast in our faith. What does it mean? How do we do that? How do we build and strengthen our faith? We do that through significant time in the Word of God. We do that through consistent prayer. We do that through strong relationships with other believers. We have to be connected with other believers who are walking the same path and on the same journey. It will hold us accountable and call us out to confession and repentance when we're not listening to the Spirit. Listen, we don't need to fear Satan. We don't need to fear Satan. The one who is in us is greater, but we have to not be foolish and naive about our enemy. No, you're not going to end up in the position this man did, completely controlled and possessed by 2,000 demons, but you can be influenced, and your life can get off course, and you can do some destructive things, and you can not be on the path God has for you because of sin that you've let go in your life. Jesus bought our freedom at an incredibly high price. We're free to live in victory. Why in the world would we choose to be enslaved by sin? Paul, in Galatians 5, and I'll close with this. For freedom... 
Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Listen, today as we look at the story of freedom, we need to be reminded that Jesus has paid an incredible price to set us free. We're not to live in bondage to sin, especially as believers. We're to live in victory and in freedom. Jesus has called us. He set us free to live for him and to tell others about the freedom that they can have in Christ.